what we are hoping today is to give you a good overview of what audiology, the audiology program is at East Tennessee State University. Um, we've got a very ambitious agenda, uh, and uh, as faculty teaching communication, we talk a lot. So, but we're going to try to keep it within the time, respecting the time, so you can get a good view of different aspects of our program. Uh, while we have this, I just wanted to show you uh, our strong affiliation with the James Quillen VA Medical Center. And if you're new to this region, that's just across the street from us. And uh, our program is well integrated with the audiology clinic uh, at the VA. And you will hear from a few of us today about that. Uh, off campus is where our clinic also is. Uh, it's in a short distance and a very scenic view going there. So our patients are very serene, quiet, <laughs> composed when they reach there uh, is our NAVE clinic. And uh, we have also proposed that for those visiting us today, uh, you're welcome to join, make a trip over there. And uh, one of our uh, clinical faculty, Dr. Shannon Bramlett, is going to be hosting it and giving you an opportunity to see what we do over here. Um, again, we're trying to do this bimodal. Um, so thank you for joining us in person, but we've got a group virtually also. And this is the first time we're doing that. We either did that in-house all the time in COVID and we moved virtual, we we're doing it both ways. And as much as we learned from technology, with technology, uh, I know there's going to be some glitches, but I want you guys to be open at any point. Uh, just raise your hand or let Ricardo know if you're online uh, and ask your question. I'd like for you guys to go with a good overview, but there's going to be some lingering questions. I want you to make sure that you know who to contact to get that information. Okay. Okay. So we'll have uh, the faculty over here are going to introduce themselves a little bit, and then through the day, through this morning, they will have opportunities to talk different aspects of the program. Um, well, Dr. Height was going to talk about clinical education and interprofessional education. Uh, Bagelson will talk about research and capstone projects, funding opportunities and application. Dr. Smizinski uh, is going to talk about that. Then we've got two of our excellent, well, we've got many of our excellent uh, students here, Halley and uh, Ricardo, uh, who's the kind of the MC out there in the back, uh, mm -hmm. is going to be uh, talking about our Student Academy of Audiology organization. Um, and then we'll welcome questions again, and then you'll have an opportunity uh, to travel to the NAVE Center, um, where our first years are actually having a lab class this morning uh, with Dr. Bramlett, and, but they will be done by the time you reach over there, and, and then they would love to talk to you about their experiences. Um, and we've got a few that you can, you can then talk to them also. Uh, and then, uh, again, it'll be an open forum, so you can hear them. And, and it'll always happen that our open house is right during the midterm time, so you might feel them a little frustrated a bit. Uh, but beyond that, I'm sure they'll give you a good idea of what they're going through in our program. Dr. Sermon Taylor. Thanks. The picture really isn't that old, <laughs> but it looks like it is. I, I made some other choices since then. Hi, my name is Dr. Beth Sturm Taylor. I'm the chair of the Department of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology. Um, I've been here for a couple of years um, and am happy to tell you this is the best place ever. Okay, um, you're making a really good choice, even by being here today. Um, the um, I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of the department, okay, and where we are situated. Audiology is a doctoral program in the Department of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology. In this same department, we have the Master's in Speech Pathology. We also have two undergraduate minors, one in Communication Disorders, that's basically the prerequisite classes um, at the undergraduate level, and we also have a minor in American Sign Language, and that may be relevant um, for you when we start talking about some of the interprofessional and collaborative kinds of activities capstone projects and those sorts of things. Our department is in the College of Clinical and Rehabilitative Health Sciences. There are three other departments, social work, um, rehab sciences, which is OT, PT, nutrition, and our new orthotics and prosthetics program. And then our other department is rehabilitative sciences, uh, no, sorry, allied health sciences. Um, and so that's going to be dental hygiene and um, respiratory therapy and a couple of other things as well. So we are in the College of Clinical and Rehabilitative Health Sciences, which is part of the larger Academic Health Sciences Center. 
And this is um, five colleges. So us, the College of Medicine, College of Nursing, Pharmacy, and Public Health. And so those five colleges have formed academic health sciences and have taken a really um, uh, specific aim of looking at uh, community engagement and regional stewardship. And so collaboratively, lots of interprofessional educational opportunities going on, um, for opportunities for students from all disciplines um, to participate together to for the greater good of the larger community in Central Appalachian region. So th this is absolutely one of the things that brought me <laughs> to this area and uh, to this institution. Um, you're going to hear lots of cool things today, um, funding opportunities and clinical opportunities and, you know, um, research and, and all the cool things. But I also want to just kind of help you keep your eye on the prize, the long term goal of becoming an audiologist. Um, again, really good choice. Um, this is one of the fastest growing um, professions, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics. The numbers look really good, really good for people who are um, audiologists. So. Um, you've made lots of good choices already today, and it's hardly even 10 o'clock. So. <laughs> um, I am going to stick around for a little while. If you have questions, um, I will be happy to entertain those. Um, but I just want to say welcome. We're really glad you're here, and I look forward to getting to know you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sumitian. So I'm a professor in this department, the program of audiology, and uh, I'm also the director. And I've been here since uh, 2005. I did my PhD at East Carolina University. Anybody from North Carolina here? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just a pirate to a buccaneer over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I, I doesn't seem long ago, but my sons remind me it was a long ago. <laughs> <laughs> so us being here, and you'll hear the same from many of our faculty that many of our faculty chose to remain here um, by virtue of the, the things that we do here, a very rewarding experience we have teaching and generating this new audiologist and also the place that we live is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, my areas of interest include auditory processing um, and I also I work with uh, individuals who have cochlear implants. Um, so another thing that you'll hear from us through this day is that many of us have research interests but we also have clinical interests. So uh, in our program, those who are, we don't see a difference between the academic faculty and clinical faculty, all the academic faculty, that with the exceptions, that we, we run clinics also. So we will teach you and then we'll work with you in clinics also in our areas that you're interested in. Hi, I'm Mark Fagelson. Uh, I've been here since 96. Um, it's my actually my first real job. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of work to get the AUD program started. When I got here, it was a master's program, so we had to make that transition. I also did a lot of work making sure that we would have um, a, a durable and sustainable relationship with the VA, which I think we also do. I teach uh, a bunch of different courses, Audubel 1, I split Audubel 2 with Dr. Smirzinski. I teach a course in medical audiology, pathologies, and tinnitus management. Thanks for nodding so that I didn't forget anything. <laughs> and uh, I would add to this down here, um, disorders of sound tolerance. So there's a uh, kind of a, a growing uh, area in our field um, where people are studying uh, patients who have some unusual sound sensitivities um, that would not be predicted from the audiogram or any other stuff, that's fine. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> and, you get that long up here. Um, and, and so that's something else that we take a look at as well. These would be, um, maybe you've heard of some of these things, like some people who have a difficult time with um, their parents slurping soup or making a lot of noise when they chew or scrape their silverware on the plate, that kind of stuff. Clearly that's not a damaging sound level, but some people respond to it in a very unusual and you know, sort of very uh, vigorous rage filled kind of way. So we, we try to work with uh, those patients as well. And they seem to be more numerous as time goes on. So I think we'll be busy uh, working with those folks as well. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I am Marcy Height. Um, so I have been here since 2017. I feel like there's a trend here. We graduate with our PhDs. We come to ETSU to teach, and we stay here. So I'm the same way. I ever, ever, well, ever since 2017, I've been working here. Um, 
My clinical and research interests are pediatrics. I do teach all the courses in the program that are pediatric. So I have one course that's a diagnostic course and then another course that's more rehab focused. Um, I also teach instrumentation for the first year students. So that's a really fun introductory course about all the different equipment we use as audiologists. As far as clinic goes, I see a good mixture of pediatric patients and adult hearing aid patients. Um, a lot of times newborns who refer on their initial hearing screening in the hospital, they come see me for ADR testing. So I do that often in the clinic. Um, I also have a specialty clinic that is a follow-up clinic for babies who experienced drug exposure in utero. So we follow up with those babies every six months just to check in on different milestones. It's a beautiful clinic because it's interprofessional. There's me, the audiologist, there's also speech language, nutrition, PT, OT, uh, nursing, a uh, pediatrician. So it's a really great chance for us to follow this child holistically and see how they're doing across all these different areas in their life. Um, yeah, I think that's it, Dr. Smirzinski. <laughs> uh, so I'm Yasek Smirzinski, I'm program coordinator. You got probably dozens of emails from me. Thank you for responding. Uh, I'm originally from Poland. That's when I got my PhD and I didn't come directly to ETSU. Oh. I started traveling around the world, uh, but I'm here for almost 19 years. Uh, actually, I'm probably the only one faculty that I don't uh, supervise students in the clinics because I don't have my clinical license. Uh, my uh, master's was in electrical engineering, majoring in acoustics. Then I switched to auditory perception and then started working. I know how many of you have the term acoustic emissions, the tests that are used for pneumon hearing screening. Then I started doing research and I'm still continuing that. Uh, so I teach two foundation courses, uh, anatomy physiology of the auditory system for first years and psychoacoustics. Uh, I split the course with Dr. Fagelson on Audible 2. That's when I teach about acoustic emissions. Uh, I also coordinate research projects. We'll talk about it, Dr. Fagelson will talk about it later. I teach a sequence of research design uh, uh, classes uh, and, uh, and do, you know, quite a lot of administration related to from application until you, you graduate, communicating with the grad school uh, and financial aid, anything that students need uh, in our program. Uh, I try to help as much as I can. Okay, thank you again for coming. Good morning, I'm Kim. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Hi. Uh, so I did an undergrad in Comdis at Western Michigan University and graduated in 94 and then I got a master's in audiology at University of Memphis in 96 because a master's in audiology was still a thing back then. And then I get a PhD, you can see on the slide there, 2000. Um, and then I did a postdoc at Boys Town National Research Hospital until 2005, and then I was an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin until 2011, and I did an invited fellowship at the University of Canterbury at Christchurch, New Zealand, and then I came here to the VA and have been affiliated also with ETSU since that time. My research interests are um, adult hearing assessment, middle ear measurements, wideband middle ear measurements, autoacoustic emissions. And so that's me in a nutshell. I'm also the service chief for audiology and speech, pag speech language pathology here at the VA. Um, did you want me to give a little bit of information while I'm here about the rotation through the VA? Oh. Yes, yes. <laughs> Got it, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, we have students first, second, third year at various points. We have routine clinics, hearing evaluations, and hearing aid fittings. We also have specialty clinics for cochlear implants and osseo-integrated devices like Baja. Um, audit, we also have auditory brainstem response and autoacoustic emission testing. We have lots of vestibular testing, and we have Dr. Feigelson who comes two half days of a week to do tinnitus assessment and counseling. 
And we also have a research program here as well. And you can, and I just talked about that. I do want to mention we have Dr. Nicholas Giuliani with us this morning. Dr. E, did you want him to say hello to everybody too? Oh, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, then I will sign off. Um, they, uh, Dr. E has my contact information. So if anybody has any questions about the rotation through our clinic or our clinic in general or our research, please let me know. I'm Dr. E. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Nick Giuliani. So I'm a research audiologist here at the VA. Um, I did my undergraduate work in music, actually. Um, that's from a, uh, so a non-traditional background. I went to St. Olaf College, and that's in Minnesota. Um, I did my graduate work at the University of Iowa, so I got my uh, AUD and my PhD there. Um, worked at the University of Iowa at the hospitals there for a while, and then I came here in January of 2020. Um, I teach the second in the hearing aids course, so that's in the summer after your first year. And then um, clinically, I work, I do a lot of different things, but I think my focus is more on what we call our uh, uh, AR class, our, our, our AR clinic, our auditory rehabilitation clinic. And so I work with um, patients who are having added difficulties with their hearing. So um, uh, maybe patients with dementia or blindness, um, severe to profound hearing loss. So I also work with cochlear implants. And then I see some of the patients who have the OSU integrated devices as well. My research interests, so I'm working on developing a line of research here. Um, primarily, I look at listening effort and the intersection of that with um, hearing and auditory disorders. And then um, also, I hope to uh, look at its intersection with balance disorders as well. So uh, thanks for coming out today. Thank you, Dr. Giuliani. Kind of just a little bit about audiology, and then it's not, it's very unlikely that you just stumbled into a doctor of audiology open house by uh, walking here. So I'm, I'm sure all of you guys have done your due diligence and much finding out about audiology, um, and probably even visited, uh, shadowed some audiologists in, in, in the city that you've been in. Um, so as you know, audiology is a health profession. And um, uh, you, as an audiologist, you would be serving a wide range of people uh, in age uh, with, with, the, with, concerns with hearing, balance, tinnitus, or other neurological, uh, neurological concerns. Um, as I said, we work in advocating, educating people about it, screening, uh, prevention, assessment, uh, management um, of, of all these conditions that we talk about. And as an audiologist, you'll find yourself working in different work environments. Uh, you would, um, the most majority would be working in like healthcare settings, in hospitals or in the ENT offices, um, but there is a growing proportion of private pay audiologists also, I mean, private clinic audiologists also as entrepreneurs. In fact, we have a few of our students who are running their own clinic right now. And then we've got educational audiology. A few of, few of our alum are actually working in the industry, either with a hearing aid company or a cochlear implant company. Um, and so there's a wide scope of different regions that, and as an audiologist, you can find employment. Uh, while you're doing all this good karma dollars that you're also not living too shabby. Uh, the mm -hmm. medium income, I think, ranges from an entry-level audiologist that runs anywhere in the higher 50s uh, to all the way high 80s, depending upon the geographic location and, uh, and the type of work environment that you work. Uh, the job outlook, as Dr. Sherman Taylor was doing, it looks fantastic. Uh, you're expected around 13% more than the average growth of jobs. So there's a growing need uh, for audiologists. Uh, and you probably know with increase in the average age of living, uh, unfortunately, one of the things with, with, with aging is hearing loss. Um, and so we need this workforce to help these individuals with these concerns. Um, so ETSU has had a communication sciences and disorders program back from the 50s. Interestingly, it's almost a decade now, in the centennial year for the university, we were looking at some alum pictures and had to go through some like microfilms in the library to collate that. Um, so we had a collage of all the pictures from the different uh, comms this programs. And what, you know, what sticked out in the, when we were doing that was that apparently the difference in the hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we've had a rich history 
of, um, of having a communication sciences and disorders program. Uh, uh, the transition that as Dr. Uh, Shire was talking about, there was still the 90s, a master's was still uh, the entry level profession. Um, but since then, Asha thought that the wide scope of audiology, uh, five semester master's was not sufficient. So it did transition into a doctorate degree. So that happened in the early 2000s with the mandate that by 2012, the entry level profession needs to have, have a doctorate degree. Uh, ETSU was one of the earlier programs uh, transitioning into the audiology uh, uh, mode. And, and that was because of the strong affiliation we had with the Mountain Home VA. And again, when you're transitioning from a master's to a doctor, you had to provide, in fact, it used to be 1,820 hours of clinical experience prior to graduation, making sure that you have this wide experience and uh, not many programs could afford that. But uh, again, with our affiliation with the VA, uh, we were one of the early programs that could do that. Uh, our first graduates, uh, we took in the first class in 2003. That's when the master's students, a few of them stayed back to continue with the doctorate uh, program of study. And then our first graduates were back in 2005. So our curriculum, all our students go, go through the same curriculum. We have a fixed curriculum and it's well thought, designed and, and charted out curriculum, um, making sure that you meet all the competencies required to be an audiologist, both by our accreditation body. Uh, we've been continuously accredited by the American Speech and Language Hearing Association. In fact, we just had an accreditation just before COVID. So we have a 120 credit hour program over the four years. Among that, 75 is those didactic courses and then 45 uh, clinical courses. And the sequence of courses uh, are arranged such that it, it, it accumulates knowledge as you transition through the different semesters. One of the strengths of our program is our well-integrated clinical experience from day one. Uh, and that's something that we, we pride on. From the first week of classes, and you'll hear that from our first years when you get to meet them, uh, they'll be rotated through clinics, um, and mainly in our ETHU, the NAVE Center that we have over here. And in addition to that, they would also have a lab course. So as you're learning those concepts in your class, you're also seeing that being used in our clinics. And I think that strengthens their knowledge. And, and another benefit of that is, as Dr. Hyde is going to be mentioning, is that our students are well prepared much ahead of time. And for, there is a, for good or bad, there is a trend um, that the fourth year externship interviews are getting earlier and earlier. Um, now, in fact, our students in the third summer, uh, I mean, the second year summer are interviewing for their fourth year placement. So in our program is such that the three years are residential and then the fourth year is a full-time immersive experience in the uh, externship. And as Dr. Hyde is gonna show you, our students are all over the country. Uh, and very prestigious for the research sites. And I think one of the reasons is because of this earlier on clinical experience that they get, uh, making them feel very confident uh, about when they're interviewing and then when they're landing themselves in a fourth year placement. Thank you. Uh, so this is just an overview. As I said, uh, first year you have those foundation courses, as Dr. Smuzinski was mentioning and Dr. Pagelson was mentioning, uh, and then we build on with a clinical uh, oriented courses as you progress into that. Uh, each year, the first and the second year, you do have a written comprehensive exam. It will be in the spring semester, making sure, and I call it celebration of education, but I don't think all the students really do that. Uh, celebration of knowledge, but yeah, they, they, it is a pretty stressful time. Uh, the first year, and, and then the second year actually will be culminating uh, more uh, exams. And the Third year, uh, it'll be a summative exam where it'll be an oral examination. So you'll have four different uh, oral exams uh, prior to embarking on your fourth year externship. And by the time that you reach there, what we would like to see, again, it's gonna be stressful, but what we like to see is when you're talking to a colleague about a case uh, in this particular disorder. And, and by then we hope that we've given you all the knowledge and the skills to have this very uh, mutual discussion of how to, how to work with this patient who needs your help. Right? Uh, part of that is also we are expecting you to do a capstone experience and you'll hear a little bit about that from Dr. Pagelson. Again, the four, fourth year is going to be an externship, all year externship, and usually it starts around May 15th to June 15th. I think it varies depending on the externship. Is that right, Ricardo? 
of when the fourth year starts. Fourth year, usually it's about June or July. Yeah, June or July. And then it extends till, till graduation. Some of them you might have a contract where you might work a few more weeks after graduation because of just the, the commitment that you, you uh, signed up for. Uh, but our students easily need uh, the required hours. So even though American Speech, Language and Hearing Association has dropped the number, they just want us to offer you a diverse and well-rounded clinical experience. Many of the state licensure still goes by that 1,820 hours. And uh, um, so our program, even before they leave, and Dr. Haidt is going to share uh, numbers with you, uh, they get a good chunk of those hours even before they embark on their fourth year extension. So the fourth year extension would be where you're fine-tuning or honing your clinical skills um, and uh, before you um, graduate. Okay. So as you can see in the next few slides, uh, between the ETHU and the VA faculty and a few of our gents, our faculty uh, cover a wide range of expertise, both research and clinical. And we bring that to our students. As I said, not only we teach you in classes in the areas that we're interested in, we also work with you in clinics in those areas that uh, we, we, we were experienced in. Um, so, and we offer you a wide range of clinical opportunities, both on-site and off-site. And uh, Dr. Hyde thinks um, does a tremendous job of trying to match you so making sure that by the time you graduate in third year, you're placed in like an ENT setting, you're placed in a VA setting, you're placed in a private clinic, um, and also with all this interprofessional education that we're known for. And moving on to that, and Dr. Samantala mentioned that, us being a part of the academic health sciences, there's a heavy focus uh, on interprofessional education. And that was a provost, a vice provost, I mean, a provost that recently retired, and our current dean, Dr. Lynn Williams, who used to be the past president of ASHA, immediate past president of ASHA, uh, they, they place a heavy emphasis on interprofessional education. And our program has been a part of embarking on this interprofessional education even before it came, became the limelight over here. And you'll hear uh, from people talking after me how we providing this interprofessional education and experiences at so many different levels, at the department level, at the university level and, and at the community level. Uh, at the university level, I want to talk a little bit about the leadership education and neurodevelopmental and related disorders, the LEND program. We are one of the very few prestigious LEND programs uh, in the country. Uh, and this is a consortium that we have with Vanderbilt University. I'm one of the faculty in the LEND program. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a program meant to uh, train our health professionals, uh, we call them as trainees, uh, through interprofessional practice and, and care. Um, and it's a kind of an eight month program and usually we recommend our third years to sign up for that. And every year we have one or two of our audiology uh, students being one of the trainees. Uh, and they are trained by professionals across Vanderbilt and ETSU and Tennessee State University from 16 different professions. Okay. And uh, it's a beautiful track where there's a core track talking about those different health professionals, and then there's a leadership track. Because the ultimate goal is that you, you take on leadership roles in those interprofessional clinics and uh, to serve the patients best in this interprofessional approach. Uh, and then the, within our program, uh, Dr. Haidt also makes a very conscious effort of providing this experience, and she'll talk a little bit more about uh, student research opportunities, Dr. Pegelson is going to talk about the capstone experience and how our students have, have, have actually presented at very prestigious forums and, and have been acknowledged for that. Uh, funding available, Dr. Smuzinski is going to talk about how we've actually been very fortunate in affording funding uh, to many of our entering class and, and beyond. And as you can talk to a few of our students, uh, you'll find out that not within the program, our students have been very attracted to GA fundings in other disciplines like disability services, uh, uh, computer science department, where else? Library. Library, legal services, scary, but yes, you <laughs> have one person there. Testing center. In the testing center. Um, <laughs> and so, and then that's actually been the serial there because every year they, our students have done so well, they've been so professional that every year the, the, the people there, they ask us to recommend students. And so we've got a for a long number, for, for many number of years, we've got a serial 
students going into this offices. Um, and the, in the next few slides, you'll see a few of our faculty involved in our program, and you can see that we have a, a tight student faculty ratio. Uh, each of our each of the students in our program are going to be matched with one of their faculty advisors. And then every semester during the midterm time, uh, we will have advising sessions. So, and all through the all through the program, you'll have one-on-one -on -one advising sessions, making sure that you're appreciating your strengths. And if there are some challenges, they're addressing that and talking about what, what to expect in the future and helping you plan for it. Okay. Um, so the next few slides, again, we're gonna give you a PDF of this and our website also has information about each of our faculty uh, and their expertise. So if that's something that you've already, like in the certain <laughs> areas you wanna work in, I welcome you to um, email and, uh, and then contact them ahead of time. So I want to take some time to talk a little bit more about the clinical education piece here at ETSU. Year one, you only have one half day of clinic. As Dr. Ellen Govan had mentioned before, we do throw you in the first week. It's just one half day, but you immediately start. You're going to be placed at the NAVE Center. That's our home clinic. My philosophy is that as you are starting, we want to keep you close to home. And as you get more and more experience, we push you further and further out into the community. So year one, you're going to be at the NAVE Center for one half day a week. Year two, you get a few more half days. So it might be three to four half days of clinic per week. In the second year, you might go out to the VA. You might still stay at the NAVE. You might start going to some local clinics, a private practice here in town, an ENT here in town. Year three, you got even more half days, five to six half days of clinic. Year three, plan to travel. I'm going to be sending you out maybe to Abingdon, which is a uh, five ways away, Asheville, Boone, Norton, Virginia, Kingsport. I'm thinking through my brain all the different places we send students. So it's quite a drive in year three, but I think those unique clinical experiences make it worth the trip for sure. And it's also this idea of the first year stay home, second year stay in the city, third years go out, right? It's just that pushing you out a little bit. Your fourth year, it's a full-time externship. You work with me a lot finding those placements, applying to those placements, and then I help you as you are selecting the placement you decide to go to. That is going to be a placement of your choosing um, geographically, where you want to go, what kind of clinic you want to be in. But I walk you through that process, and it's a full-time nine-to-five Monday through Friday position. So we've talked a lot about our on-campus clinics and our off-campus clinics. Let me just walk through that a little bit more in detail with you. Our two on campus that we're referring to, the first one's the audiology clinic at the NAVE. So this is the one out in Elizabethton. This is also where we do the clinic lab. Um, so, so we used to have the clinic lab at the Johnson City Community Health Center, but this past year we've actually moved it all to the NAVE. So everything has been at the NAVE currently. Annually, uh, the Mountain Home VA serves a very large population of veterans, over 12 thousand veterans and over 19,000 patient visits, dispensing over 4,000 hearing aids, 700 wireless devices, an incredibly active clinic over at the Mountain Home VA. These two are what we consider our on-campus clinics, the NAVE and then the VA. Off-campus, we have a whole bunch of different people um, in our community who collaborate with us to take students, maybe one day a week, maybe several days a week. We have private practices, ENT offices, speech and hearing centers, um, hospitals, public school systems. So we, I, Dr. Fagelson before me and I have worked really hard to build these relationships with the community to send our students to these different sites. So just to list our current ones, as I mentioned before, some of these you might be driving away, Asheville and Abingdon, Blue Ridge ENT is out in Boone. So for those who are from that area, you might be familiar with some of those. Also, I, I don't think I have it on here, but App State, Dr. Russell has been taking some of our students also. 
Oh, I do have it. No, no, sorry. Appalachian Speech and Hearing is the name of a private practice here in town, so that got me confused. But App State, I should probably add on here too, because they've started taking our students. But I think it's a it's a it's a nice mixture. Sorry, Ricardo. It's a nice mixture of different types of clinics. So I wanted to give you an idea of how many hours should I would I expect to see in our program here at ETSU. So I just averaged together um, first year student clinical data related to the amount of hours they got in their first year, the setting types, the patient types. So you can see here across all of our students, uh, they had an average of 124 patient contact hours. I distinguish that contact hour from total clinic hours because students count hours for everything they do in the clinic. You saw a patient, yes, but then you wrote a report on them. You called the hearing aid company and ordered a device for them. You sat and talked to Dr. Bramlett for a few minutes. All of that counts in your clinical education. So that's why the total clinic hour number is a little higher than your actual patient contact time. Keep in mind, this is across three semesters, fall, spring, and summer. Uh, on average, students in their first year collect 124 hours. You'll also see that the majority of these hours are at the ETSU clinic. That's the NAVE clinic. That's where I keep you. So it makes sense that most of your hours are from the NAVE. But you'll see a smattering of other things on here. Uh, the VA, they start taking students in your first summer. So students who are selected for the VA placement, they will get those hours at the VA. We also have um, a lot of interprofessional opportunities for, that are available to students and virtual clinic opportunities. Let me talk about virtual clinic briefly. So COVID hit and we were forced to go online, right? So we really racked our brains trying to figure out how do you teach students about clinic online? We developed a case-based virtual clinic that was very different from hands-on clinic but we all actually really liked it, the faculty and the students together, because it gives us a chance to talk about these cases and ask deeper questions. Like, okay, in clinic, I may push these buttons because you're telling me to, but why? Why am I doing it this way? What is the evidence behind this clinical decision you're making? So in virtual clinic, we really have the opportunity to talk through that. So we've decided to keep it. So in your first year spring, we add in your half day of actual clinic and a half day of virtual clinic. Oh, and just quickly, this is a lovely pie chart that shows the age range for your patients. So at the NAVE, we see a good variety. All the pediatrics are up here, um, adults, and then geriatric over here. I also like to point out our students have marked what they have observed in clinic versus how they have assisted in certain procedures and then what they've actually performed. So you may have watched somebody do an ABR or you may have actually performed pure tone testing yourself. So keep in your mind's eye what that kind of looks like because on our next slide here, we're gonna look for at second years. Okay, so in your second year, three semesters again, fall, spring, and summer, you get about two to three Three to four half days, we'll say two to four, we'll split the difference. Two to four half days in your second year, students on average have 263 patient contact hours. So let me point out the differences here. You're, they're still getting some hours at our NAVE clinic, but now they're also going to an ENT. They're also doing these specialty clinics. The Baby Steps Clinic is the um, intrauterine drug exposure clinic I was talking about before. Dr. Ellen Govan also runs a high-risk clinic. These are babies who are NICU babies, and we're following up on the NICU babies development. Virtual clinic is still in there too. The interprofessional multidisciplinary rotations are in there. Private practice is in there. And then the VA is also in there. Quite a good number is at the VA. So two things to talk about really quick. The VA is an amazing clinical opportunity. And I wish I could send all of you there, or, or all the students in our program, I wish I could send you all there. But they do have limited resources. They have limited space. They have limited faculty. So they can't take all 12 of our students. So they recently did started an application process. Um, historically, it's been six students out of the 12 that they take, and you do all of your clinic in the second year there at the VA. 
they've recently had several audiologists retire, so they can only take four in the upcoming year, I think is the plan. Hopefully, as maybe uh, Dr. Shire might shoot me for saying this, but I'm hoping that as they maybe hire more faculty, they can go back up to six, maybe. But four is the current number that they're going to start taking, just so you know that when you're applying, if you're applying to the program. It is an amazing clinical opportunity, though, so I strongly encourage all students to apply to it just because of that really amazing experience you'll get there. The second thing I want to point out is these interprofessional multi-disc rotations. This is something that I have created to fill a need. We, we as audiologists, I want you all to be well-rounded, and I want you to have these variety of clinical experiences. But we have found there were certain areas that our students were missing. Deaf culture was one of them. Newborn hearing screenings in the hospital was another one. Um, working with individuals who might be on the spectrum or have sensory disorders was another one. So we've created these multidisciplinary rotations where you're placed there for a full semester, but you rotate through three different clinics. In the second year, students rotate through the actual newborn hearing screening that's done in the local hospital. They rotate through Kremley House Clinic. This is a facility for individuals with traumatic brain injury. We have speech language pathologists who go there and the audiology students join them. And then they also rotate through a um, ASL deaf culture seminar. So those three experiences are what you go through in the second year. In the third year, we have a auditory verbal therapy clinic if you're not familiar with that, it's a sort of speech language intervention for individuals who wear hearing aids or cochlear implants. We also go through the positive eating program. This is for individuals who have sensory issues and maybe struggle with um, different eating type issues. But our audiology students also go to just learn more in general about how to assess somebody who has these sensory, sensory type issues. The third one is a vestibular PT placement, so a physical therapist who does vestibular rehab. So again, all of these little specialty clinics that our students get to rotate through. You'll also notice our pie chart over here. Also notice how you're now performing more than you're observing. Isn't it exciting? You're growing up, right? You're doing more of the things instead of just observing. Third year, you might be a little sad, like, hey, that number was supposed to get really big, right? And, and it is big because it's across only two semesters. All the data we've looked at before was across three semesters. But in your third year, I only count fall and spring because by your third summer, you've started your fourth year. So you're not really a third year anymore. So in those two semesters, on average, 237 patient contact <laughs> hours. Look at all that ENT experience. Holy smokes. So lots of ENT, still some at the NAVE. Still those specialty clinics, still in a professional, a lot more in the private practice, and lesser in the VA. You still might go to the VA in your third year. They do a lot of vestibular clinic in the third year, but you'll see the majority of it is going to be in these other clinics. Patient age demographic there, and then we see an even larger green bar here for you actually performing these tests. Fourth year. The fourth year is going to be a lot. I'm not going to lie. You're working full time, so it makes sense that you're going to be getting a lot of hours. So on average, our last group of fourth years, over the summer, and the third summer is how you can think of it, the fall and the spring, 871 patient contact hours, 1,500 total clinic time. So they spend a lot of time in the clinic doing report writing, consulting with their um, preceptors, maybe doing trainings and different things, manufacturer training. So all of that adds up to be quite a large amount of hours. For our current group of fourth years, many of them went to an ENT placement, many of them went to private practice, and many of them went to VA. So those are kind of the big um, focus areas for those fourth year spots. Look at that green bar. By the time you're a fourth year, you might observe some in the first couple of weeks because it's a new clinic to you. But the idea for the fourth year is you should be pretty much functioning as an audiologist, independently doing your own thing, seeing your own patients. And for our current group of fourth years, uh, a pretty good spread across the different demographics and age ranges for their patients. So at graduation, 
I broke it down year by year, but if you put it all together cumulatively, at graduation, the students who go through our program have over 1,500 hours of direct patient contact and over 2,000 hours of just clinical experience. Dr. Ellen Govan hinted at earlier, there's no specific number of hours that you need to graduate, but many states still require that 1820 for an audiology license. So just so you know, our students have never had an issue hitting that number in the past. We typically have way more hours than you need by the time you graduate. I also just wanted to show you geographically where we send students on their fourth year externships. So this is the class of 2023, our current group of fourth years. So a nice little spread all the way out here in Las Vegas, all the way up to Maine. There is a little cluster. Um, people do tend to stick around closer to home, but there's a couple of other ones who maybe home was in Louisiana. So they went back to Louisiana for their fourth year. This one's MD Anderson. So I think she just wanted that unique experience that MD Anderson offers. Class of 2022, so the ones who just graduated this May. Um, again, kind of a nice spread here. Somebody who's all the way out in Wyoming, Michigan, Alabama, Virginia. Um, you'll also see it's a nice range of the types of clinics. We have people who go to the VAs. We have people who go to university clinics, people who go to ENT clinics. So our students have the opportunity to go anywhere they want pretty much, any type of clinic that they'd like. Next one, I, I, I stopped breaking it down year by year. I thought that would take too long. So this last one is kind of a, a bunch altogether, 2004 to 2022. And I actually think Dr. Smirzinski made this slide, so I need to give him the credit. But what's fun about this slide is you do see more of that spread out to the West, but we also are very proud about our students here who went to Alaska and Hawaii. So. The one who went to Hawaii was from Maine. Michigan. Oh, gosh. <laughs> she was from Michigan, so she yeah. really enjoyed what warm weather. <laughs> she had a mobile testing her after she graduated, and those hopping between islands between the. And you were all jealous. From yes, that. I know. I'm, I'm jealous. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, I believe these next couple of slides here. I just listed them out. So if you're a visual person who likes to see the map, or if you're a more analytical person who likes to see the list. I have it both ways for you. But I want to point out our strong history of sending students to the VA for their fourth year. I do think we have that relationship with Mountain Home VA here to thank for that. Our students just get that really strong VA experience and they're very competitive candidates whenever they're applying to these fourth years at the VA. And then we've also had students who join the military for their fourth year. So that's that's an option too. So I won't read all of these to you, but again, just kind of demonstrating that variety of ENT placements that students have decided to go to for their fourth years. And then hospital settings, um, a great variety across uh, the nation that students have gone to. Sorry, Ricardo. <laughs> a couple of university settings. We do have one educational audiology setting. And just so you know, this is a placement where I send students in the program too, like first year, second year, well, not first and second, likely your third year, right? Because the third year is when I send you out into the world. But this is one educational audiologist who works with our program and takes students. Next one, private practice, there's Island Audiology at the very top there. Um, but a good variety of different private practices that students have decided to go through for their externship. Community health care centers are also a big one um, that students have decided to go to. And I believe that's it. So um, I tried to give you a really wide range of all those clinical opportunities and experiences. But if you have any questions about that, you'll have my information at the end here. So please just let me know. I'm happy to talk more about it. 
Hello everyone online and also um, the people that are in person. I'm actually uh, working with the first years this morning in their clinic lab class, so I'm in the classroom right now, but welcome um, to the open house today. And um, I'm going to, in a second, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ETSU Center for Audiology and Speech Language Pathology, which is where I spend most of my time in the clinic. I am a clinical faculty member. And we're going to share a little slide in just a second um, that's sort of a tour for those of you that are joining us virtually so you could get an idea of what the clinic looks like and how it operates. For those that are traveling over here afterwards, sorry, the internet over here is not being polite. Um, for those traveling over afterwards, we will give you an in-person tour. So this is just information about um, our clinic and all the different types of services that we provide here. So you will see we provide um, anything from newborn babies to adults, newborn hearing screenings, electrophysiology, auditory brainstem responses. Uh, we do some neonatal intensive care follow-up. Uh, lots of pediatric audiology. We have pretty equal population of pediatrics and adults. Uh, we do auditory processing evaluations, and um, I work quite a lot with cochlear implant candidacy and osseo integrated devices. We currently have um, over 300 patients that come to our center that utilize um, implantable devices. Oh, this is information about me. Um, my primary clinical interest is in um, the area of pediatric audiology as well as cochlear implantation. I also really enjoy being involved in community engaged matters such as humanitarian audiology and we're very fortunate that we have a lot of opportunities to engage in our community and provide a lot of care for those um, patients and those individuals in our community that might need that care. Here a little bit more information um, about the ETSU Center for Audiology. We do some um, preschool screenings, adult hearing conservation, diagnostic assessment. We fit quite a lot of adult hearing aids as well as pediatric hearing aids. Uh, Dr. Fagelson has a clinic here where he works with tinnitus and hyperacusis patients. We do community health fairs and there are, it is a multidisciplinary facility as our speech language pathology colleagues are also many of them located over here. We have an auditory verbal therapist that works a lot with some of our children that have hearing aids implantable devices and are working towards a spoken language approach for um, language development. Um, one of our, two of the clinic GAs created this little slideshow to just give you a virtual tour of what the clinic looks like. So here is the outside of the building and for those of you that are coming um, later, you'll get to see it in person. Um, and you can kind of see our ETSU Health logo. We are under the ETSU Health umbrella, which is nice because we have access to primary care physicians. We all use a shared um, electronic health record. So that's why you'll see ETSU Health logo on our building. This is a picture of our waiting room. Um, this is the main waiting room where the patients come in and wait for their appointments. These are our very hard working windows where um, our um, patient care managers work and check in all the patients, take care of their insurance benefits. Uh, they really keep the clinic flowing smoothly. Here is a picture of our audiology suite. And of course you can see we're very proud of our little map with our extern placements. And I know Dr. Height just shared that with you. So it's a really exciting time when students get to put their little dot um, on the map of where it is that they're going for their extern site. This is audio, one of the audiology suites. It's primarily outfitted for adults and we have um, the GSI equipment in this room and you'll see a verifit screen where we do hearing aid verifications, but this just gives you an idea of what that suite looks like. This is the inside of that suite and you'll see our tympanometer where the patient sits, our visual response audiometry, which is utilized for testing young children. This is our pediatric suite. It is outfitted with Madsen equipment, which is a different um, manufacturer because we want you to be well-rounded and have access to utilizing lots of different equipment so that you're prepared when you go out into the community. Um, we just took this picture this week. That's why it says Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> 
you'll see the Oracle, which is also another um, hearing aid verification. And you can kind of see all those little bins that are labeled. We have lots of little pieces and parts that belong to cochlear implants for cochlear implant programming and all of our hearing aid devices. We have to stay organized with all the audiologists and clinicians that utilize our space. I'm kind of like the clinic mom. I have to make sure it's all organized. <laughs> Here you'll see the inside of this booth, and it's outfitted also with two VRE systems, including a video VRA. You'll see our auditory brain response um, system that's on that little cart. So this is where we test newborn babies or people that are having sight of lesion testing. Um, and um, you'll see a little touch screen in there, which is really cool because we can control the audiometer from inside the booth. We utilize that for also student education, helping them work through using the equipment and things like that. And that is one of our former students, and she's a happy student doing her testing. Um, so <laughs> you can her. Um, she is a successful uh, audiologist now. And I think that is all, so I will stop the screen share there. And then I guess I'll let Ricardo switch back to the other PowerPoint. All right. So uh, I guess before we get back to the PowerPoint, the next video is just a tour of the VA and that facility. I figured it'd be easier to kind of share going into that and then go back to the PowerPoint. The pre-COVID, we used to actually invite you guys to, to tour the VA facility also, which was very impressive. But unfortunately, with COVID and, of course, the health of the veterans, it was primary for us that we, we were not involved on that. The East Tennessee State University Doctor of Audiology program is a collaboration between the ETSU College of Rehabilitative Sciences Department of Audiology and the James H. Quillen Veterans Affairs Medical Center Department of Audiology. The collaboration between facilities provides extensive educational and clinical opportunities for our doctoral students. The ETSU VA faculty consists of nine PhD level, 15 AUD level, one master's level audiologist, and several adjunct professors. In addition to the vast clinical possibilities, the curriculum offered in our program prepares students for the educational demands in all areas of audiology. James H. Quillen Healthcare System and the Mountain Home VA Healthcare System are located adjacent to the ETSU main campus and within the community of Johnson City. The 247-acre campus boasts a park-like setting and contains many historical buildings and the National Cemetery. Since 1903, James H. Quillen VA Medical Center has been improving the health of men and women who have so proudly served our nation. Services are available to more than 170,000 veterans living in a 41-county area of Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky. 31 of the 54 buildings are historic landmarks. The Department of Audiology is on the ground floor of Building 209. The entrance to Building 209 is also the main entrance to the emergency room and is currently the only entrance in use. The VA faculty has 13 full-time audiologists, two part-time audiologists, and three health technicians. In 2019, they issued 4,220 hearing aids. Due to COVID-19, everyone entering our facilities is screened and visitors are limited. Face coverings are mandatory and social distancing is practiced. The facilities at the VA are state-of-the-art in order to serve our nation's veterans. The VA Audiology Department has 13 sound suites and booths, seven programmable hearing aid stations, two evoked potential systems, two VNG systems, two rotary chairs, and two posturography units. The VA also has a teleaudiology suite. Currently, only tinnitus counseling is offered via teleaudiology. In addition to providing world-class health care to United States veterans, the Mountain Home Veterans Affairs Medical Center is also home to one of the country's top centers in the area of audiology and vestibular balance research. Research is focused on improving the quality of life for veterans 
with hearing and balance disorders and developing clinical best practices for the assessment and rehabilitation of hearing and balance function in veterans and the community at large. Hearing loss and tinnitus are the most common service-connected disabilities in veterans, and dizziness and balance disturbances are common symptoms associated with blast exposure and mild traumatic brain injury. To prepare for VA clinic, the audiology department has three designated student workrooms. While serving veterans as a student at the Mountain Home VA is important to uphold the Mountain Home VA mission statement. Honor and serve America's veterans by providing exceptional health care that is patient-centered and preferred by veterans. Located on the Mountain Home campus is Building 60. It is a state-of-the-art, newly remodeled facility dedicated to preparing practice-ready health professionals in an innovative, interprofessional, experiential learning and research environment. The two-year IP experience involves collaboration between medical, PT, SLP, nursing, pharmacy, and audiology, and includes activities with simulated patient encounters. Thank you for watching the James H. Quillen Department of Audiology virtual tour. We look forward to one day meeting you in person. Uh, so there's not much to add to that. Um, you saw some of the statistics on a previous slide. Keep in mind that our students were involved in, I'll just estimate about half of those. So you're talking about thousands of hearing aids per year, hundreds of vestibular examinations per year, et cetera. And this is um, one of the ways that, as we've learned over the years, this is one of the ways that our students are perceived as very competitive when they go out for jobs in the fourth year experiences. They've got some skills that a lot of other programs can't offer, and that's specifically some of the vestibular stuff and some of the tinnitus stuff. Lee is the research component to the program and the capstone experience. When Dr. Hyde was talking about clinic, remember that's what the program is. It's a clinical doctrine, okay? So the clinic is the main thing. The research component has a couple of different uh, angles to it, but one of them is to make sure that the students that graduate from this program are able to consume research as professionals. So it's, we all hope that when students graduate, they keep reading, you know, they keep looking at journals, they, you know, keep up with whatever's coming out, and not just from like manufacturers, advertisements and stuff at conferences where the, you know, in industry gives out like, you know, games and lollipops or, you know, like whatever they give out these days. But we want you to be able to pick up a journal article and actually make sense of it and decide whether what's written in the article as perhaps a new intervention strategy is something that you might like to try. And you need to understand what went into the work you know that led to that journal article because they're not all created equal so a big part of learning how to read research is actually trying to conduct it yourself i'll just come out and say it it's not as important as your clinic work right but it should make you better at your clinic work and that's why we require it Okay, so students do a variety of different kinds of projects, uh, but not a lot of basic science, right? Nobody's putting stuff under microscopes. Nobody's uh, excising temporal bones from cadavers and counting hair cells. It'd be great, right? But that's not really what we're about. Students do things like, and you know, just feel free to jump in. They do things like um, work out, um, uh, sort of like uh, audiologic rehab counseling type sessions for families, for parents of kids with hearing loss, and then maybe do a pre-test to see what they understand and maybe do a post-test to see what they understand after you've done this workshop with them. So there's those kinds of projects. Students come up with little surveys they might like to ask uh, teachers or family members, or, you know, so it's that kind of thing. Not a lot of basic science, not a lot of uh, having to validate surveys, which could take years to do, but stuff that 
addresses a clinical issue, maybe, that you've thought about, that you're not satisfied as being handled properly, you know, maybe some kind of way to communicate with families that other people haven't really thought about or haven't really tested. That's the kind of stuff that our students end up doing. And I am really, really uh, sort of satisfied, gratified, more, more like it, and actually just kind of blown away by some students who come into the program with no interest at all in conducting research, and then they end up taking a job or getting offered a job later on during or after their fourth year where they will be able to contribute to a big project. I'm thinking specifically of somebody who I think went um, last year to the Spark Center in Alabama, and one of the people she worked with was a faculty member who had a project going where she was studying kids in a variety of different ways. And our student did so well in the clinic that she was seen as a possible research partner for this faculty member. So here comes a student who all she ever wanted to do was work with kids. Seriously, like that's all she wanted to do. And now she's plugged herself into a really productive research team simply because she was so good at testing the kids in the first place, right? And she had this, not just that ability, but going through the program did something to her willingness to question stuff, you know, and her and her agency, if you will, her her feelings that she was actually a pretty good person to be asking these questions and helping somebody else answer them. And so, ideally, that's what the capstone can can kind of help you with, if it turns out that's something that you want to do, right? So we require it just mainly to make sure that you know how to read. I know you know how to read, but you know, read critically and be able to say, even though I'm the rookie, even though I'm the person who doesn't really know what's going on, this is not right. Or this is really good, let me do it this way, right? So that's ideally maybe what goes into the projects. The capstones, don't worry about them. You got years to go before you need to really worry about it, right? You can think about stuff you see in the clinic, right? But at the same time, it, 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 when students are just starting out, well, let, let's not worry about writing research. Let's worry about showing up to clinic on time wearing clothes and, you know, like, and making sure that you're taking care of business in the classroom. And then maybe after the first summer, getting into the second fall, maybe we can talk about it a little bit then, right? But you want to get an understanding of what's going on before you make any big decisions about, like, what you might like to study what you might like to research. Any questions about that? Great. That wasn't for the second year. You guys need to stop waiting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I said that. The second fall, I said, right? <laughs> As you know, uh, last year, uh, we switched and joined uh, 60 AUD programs across the country using the central application system, CCAS. We had a couple of glitches last year. Hopefully, this, this cycle will be smoother. It simplifies several things. Uh, as the proud father of two adult daughters, uh, I know it costs more money to go through the CCAS, but that's uh, how most of the programs are uh, going through that, that system. I, I can't recall the track who already started. Uh, if you start it, uh, you, anybody can start. I mean, I can sign up for AD program, I know, putting my name and, and it's there. Uh, and then you can you can slowly add several components. But one thing that I would like, would like to clarify, because sometimes there, there was a confusion with students who applied last year. Even, the, even though you go for the seed cast, you still have to submit a simple, very simple uh, application to the ETSU site. Unfortunately, that was the $55 additional. The reason is that there are some additional, there are some additional questions related because we are state university there are different questions related to to, to being a, a tendency state uh, institution how it works is all materials submitted for seedcast our grad admissions team they 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 change the structure of the grad school over several years so there's a team working those specialists working on the applications they also have access to the components submitted to SeedCast, so they can download that formal application and then double check 
and then once that is completed, that's why, you know, sometimes everything is fine, but the student had to submit application to the ETSU site, uh, and then they verify the application, this application becomes available to us. I show the admissions committee, I'm the one who, who tries to communicate with students, with CITCAS, with our uh, grad school. We have great working relationship with everybody in the grad school, all deans and their specialists. So we try to make that process as smooth as possible. Admission requirements. Uh, so we, we're looking at the uh, uh, cumulative GPA of 3.25 on the 4.0 scale for the last two years of undergrad within the major. Sometimes, you know, we, we had students that went through different path leading to applying to audiology. So it's not always, we, we look, you know, individually in every application. Uh, the decision was made uh, following the trend across the country uh, of dropping the GRE requirement. When the COVID hit, we, we suspended that requirement because there were a lot of issues how to get the GRE testing. Last year, we went back and then after a long discussion, uh, we decided to drop the GRE uh, uh, requirement. I know that you probably will apply to some programs that still require GRE. If you would like us to consider that GRE, that's fine, but we, we don't require that. Uh, those are the prereqs. You, you, when, when you look at that, we are one of one of a uh, few programs across the country uh, that we actually don't require any prereq related to, uh, to, to uh, CDIS. We had students that came to our program majoring in dance, theater, English, sound engineering, and they did fantastic. We just, I think one of the, it's not admission requirement, but I think it should be understanding what the field of study and what your career would be. So again, we had student that was assistant to the very famous director in Hollywood. And said, I don't want to be in this nasty environment for the rest of my life. I would like to help people. And she is now very successful at the allergies mm -hmm. in DC. But she came to our program with the understanding of the field is. So I think we should add that probably with the largest farms, that's the, not the admission requirement, but your decision-making requirement to understand what the geology is about. So the deadline is February 1st. Again, be careful because when, when those components are submitted to CITCAS and also to ETSU, that process needs to be completed by February 1st. Then there are official transcripts from all colleges. That's also very important. If uh, a student took one credit course during the Simon Community College, the official transcript from that one credit also needs to be included in your application. Even if the credit was transferred to the major, your major program, the transcript needs, needs to be there. Uh, we, the, we require three letters of recommendation. Again, everything goes to the seat cast, so those uh, faculty members, whether you decide to write a letter, uh, they are informed automatically for CITCAS, they submit the recommendation there. Uh, we require personal essay uploaded within the application, a CV or resume. So this personal essay, we really would like to know why you decided audiology is is your passion, why you would like to do it. Uh, we have a kind of internal joke, uh, but that's true. Every year we have, okay, because I have a grandmother and I realized she has some problems with hearing. And when she had her hearing it fitted, I, I realized her, that's a big difference. Sure, that's important. Uh, we just would like to, to know how you get the path to the object. Again, if you major in English, uh, biology, psychology, that's fine. Again, looking what the long-term goal, because it's a very demanding program. I mean, you can talk to our students, 
they will tell you, okay, they sometimes they just hate me because I just put them in the foundation courses over the limits. <laughs> and uh, and we say it should be difficult because it's a doctoral program. And you don't want to spend, you know, four years and a lot of money as uh, it's not for me. So looking that you really would like to, to do it. If you have, and I know because still COVID is around, if you have any problems with shadowing, depending again how you get into the, the uh, what, what's your major in undergrad. May, some, some students might have an opportunity to work in the undergrad program in the clinic. The more opportunities you have to observe, to realize what the field is about, the better. Okay. Uh, also, we would like to have this uh, kind of CV or resume. The, the issue is that we would like to know some additional aspects of your life, meaning, I mean, not gossips, but uh, for example, if somebody is fluent in foreign language or maybe took classes in the American Sign Language, it's a big class for us. If you have some uh, professional affiliation, professional experiences, if you did some charity work, we the reason is that I think the you can also talk to our students, and I think they would agree. Time management is probably the key for, formula for success in the program. So if you look and say, okay, somebody had a good grade, but on the top of that. Work part time to support education, show, and work in the community. That this, that that. It means that student knows how to manage time, how working, and going. You know, the sky is the limit. So actually, that's that's probably should be corrected. Typically, we we try to get the first decision sometimes as early as mid February, close to the the end of February. Uh, not later than early March. We would like to schedule a formal, we call it interview, it's more like an informational session, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. If somebody can come to town, do it, that's fine. Uh, even before before COVID with the, the, the phone uh, interviews, then we everybody had to learn how to use Zoom, so we do Zoom interviews. We'll try, if the application is completed, then we have access to that. We can start actually scheduling those interviews maybe as early as mid-January. We know some programs might have an application deadline earlier. Some might have December 1st, some December 15th, some January 1st. So we would like to start processing that applications as early as possible, but interview is again an opportunity for us as a faculty to talk to the, to the prospective student to learn and then also to answer questions because it's a big decision on both sides. For students, I know you will typically students apply to five, six, eight different programs. We would like students to find the best match. Again, thank you for coming and for those on Zoom to joining because I think that's an opportunity to learn some highlights and every program is structured a little bit different. Uh, we try as much as we can uh, to help you financially. Again, it comes from my personal life, being a father of three adults. I know, uh, and thank you parents coming here, uh, it, is, uh, it is expensive. We try as much as we can uh, to help students. So we have tuition scholarship opportunities. Those are for first year students. Typically, we have three of those for incoming class. Uh, if students are assigned to a faculty, the tuition scholarship waives all out-of-state and in-state tuition for the fall and the spring. You probably already uh, realized that we're running more like trimesters, so students also take a pretty heavy load during the first two summers. So that tuition scholarship also waives out of state tuition during the summer. One thing is that all students have to pay different fees. I'm sure you know that you have it in your undergrad programs. So it's technology fee, uh, football fee, uh, and then uh, some others. Plus we have also $50 per credit hours 
for every core students taking every uh, ETSU Health Science Center. So that comes roughly to about 1750 per trimester. None of the financial aid uh, covers those uh, fees. There are also uh, graduate assistantships or GAs. A full GA is 20 hours a week. For during the first year, I don't think our students can afford working 20 hours a week outside the program because first year is pretty tough. Uh, so we try to cut those GAs into half. So it's a half GA, it requires 10 hours a week. Those of you who will be going to the, to the NAVE, you will meet some of those clinical GAs that are working there. They have in the clinics, uh, do a lot of things around there. It weighs half of in-state, but even though it's a half a GA, it weighs all out of state tuition for the fall, spring and summer. So this is worth about $25,000 a year. Pays a stipend of $3,500. And again, uh, the, uh, those fees are there. Now, our students are very, very successful in finding some of those GAs outside our department. Again, uh, we are very often approached by directors of the disability services, testing center, library, typically in the spring. Could you recommend any a rising second or third year student for, for the GA positions because we already work with audiology department for 10 or 15 years and your students are the best. I'm not lying. I mean, they say your students are the best. Can I have more audiology students than my GA? So we're really working very hard and trying to help those. But I think that would be my, my, my advice would be not to take a full GA during the first year. During the second, uh, it's still a little tricky. During the third year, it's, it's much easier, especially in, if those GAs could be, uh, the work could be done, not necessarily during regular business hours like 8 to 4.30, because students are more in the clinic. So our approach is, okay, here's your clinical schedule. You have to readjust your GA schedule because Dr. Hyde, I mean, she's doing an amazing job like really putting a, a puzzle, how to create the, those clinical rotations for every student. For those of you who are from North Carolina or Virginia, in your residence of the border counties, then you pay in-state tuition. We, as a program, we don't determine the residency. This is done by the, one of the associate deans of the grad school. There are some forms, some documentation. So, for example, if a student is at, you know, Appalachian State, but the, the residency is somewhere else, being in the school there, that it's not your formal residence. So, there, there are some rules, uh, and those that are in the border counties, they pay in situation. Again, it saves a lot of money. We do have a question um, kind of related to this is, do, does ETSU's AED program partner with the academic common marketplace? Okay, that's a great question. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term academic common market. It used to be that till last year, that for those uh, states, they do not have AUD programs, specifically it's Georgia and South Carolina. They don't have AUD programs. So those students came to, and we have one, one group that out of 12 students, we have five from Georgia. They came to our program and pay in state tuition. Last year, academic common market was canceled. We still trying to figure out who made that decision. We couldn't figure out why it was made. So academic common market per se doesn't exist anymore. We are working very hard and Dr. Ongalan can probably say more about it. We're going up to the president of the university, trying to bring that kind of memorandum of understanding, allowing students from Georgia and South Carolina coming to our program to pay in state tuition. It's a long process. We can guarantee it. We'll know more about it by... It seems uh, supportive. They seem supportive at the institutional level, but our institution is, a, is under the care of a board of trustees. So it's November is when the, this proposal would go up to the board of trustees. And again, we cannot guarantee. We did highlight that there was a significant uh, issue because uh, we have got students, we've got great students from Georgia uh, and, and South well, Georgia mainly, 
uh, who have become alum and have gone back and they're working in the, in the good health system over there. Um, so that can be common market. I mean, it exists, but it doesn't exist for audiology anymore. Mm -hmm. So they've created that into a, only for masters, not uh, pre-professional doctoral degrees. And you're trying to make the distinction that the doctoral degree is the entry level profession for audiology, but unfortunately that hasn't been heard. Um, so we were still hopeful that we might get some financial benefits for those who are residents of Georgia and South Carolina. Um, but at this point, we can't get any other question from chat. Okay. That was the only one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who are out of state, uh, I have a kind of good news, actually, a kind of big house. It's not a huge amount of money, but still quite a lot of money. So the grad school provides uh, different uh, uh, types of scholarships. There is no application required. If a student uh, applies to our program, gets our offer, accepts our offer, the system automatically flags that student as eligible for some of those uh, three different types of out-of-state scholarship. Again, one thing is, uh, and this is true, during your app, on your application, there's one question. Would you be interested or would you like to be considered for the scholarship? Don't forget, don't forget to check. Yes. <laughs> Believe it or not, there was one student recently who didn't check that. And the system automatically ignores her. So, honestly, I haven't seen a student who said, I have plenty of money, I don't need you. you know? <laughs> so, so, check that box. Yes, I would like a scholarship. And um, so, depending on the residency, there is so-called uh, uh, George Carter Scholarship Plus, those are out of the student who are residents of those two counties in North Carolina, that provides up to $17,000 per academic year. I said up to because it depends on the, 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 the course load. Uh, we had, we, so far, we, I can't recall if we have any student having that, but we have several students taking the Carter Scholarship. And I asked the scholarship office why is that said, okay, somebody wants to come at George cycle 250 miles from Johnson City. If somebody is in the country that is 250 miles or less from the from our campus, that provides $14,000 per academic year. Uh, those students that are beyond 250 miles from campus are, are, are automatically getting the Gilbert Scholarship. So there are kind of as typically in life, there's a good news and a bad news. I mean, the good news is you don't have to apply. Students get it automatically. Another good news is automatically renewable uh, up to nine for the entire duration of the program. The bad news is that those scholarships cannot be combined with tuition scholarship or GA positions. But if you do a simple math, those scholarships, I mean, the GA or TS, it's much better deal financially. If you have any question about that, uh, I can let I, I can I'd be more than happy to answer those questions, you know, for email or, or after. We also have in our department three scholarships for outstanding students. Those, those were established, uh, two were established by uh, related to those students that graduated from our program. Uh, Ms. Lori Higgins graduated from our master's program several years ago. She was practicing audiologist in this area. And then she established a scholarship to help the second year student. Uh, and so it goes through the nominations by the faculty. Cuba scholarship was established by, by parents of one student who graduated from 2015 to recognize how they say she, she got an excellent education, would like to help some other students. So they donated money and that's what Cuba scholarship is. Kim Masuka scholarship was established few months ago. There's a memorial scholarship for students who graduated in 2015. Unfortunately, about two years ago, she was battled, battling cancer. And so her classmates, parents, faculty, uh, we started fundraising, we established endowment, and uh, one, the first student got that award. Uh, those scholarships are at least $1,000, could be as high as Three or four thousand dollars, depending on the year. Again, my advice: having good grades, be good in the clinic, be good citizen, 
and you might get some next time on the phone I would do talk to you. I guess Hallie can come up here with me to talk about this. I bet you guys are wondering who's pressing the button. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ricardo. Um, I guess to first introduce myself, I did my undergrad um, at the University of Virginia. Um, go those. Um, I started at ETSU in class of 2020, so I'm in third year with Hallie right here. I'm talking a little bit about my clinical interests. My interest is pediatrics. I'm also one of the Vanderbilt Lynn trainees. So if you have any questions about that or kind of, you know, my peds clinical experiences, feel free to ask at the end. So I'm Hallie. Um, what did you go over? So I went to Appalachian State University in North Carolina. My clinical interests include pediatrics, cochlear implants, and working with adults a little bit. Um, let's see. I'm also a GA at Disability Services. I had their half GA last year, and I'm a full GA. I'm actually on my lunch break right now, <laughs> so I'll be back up there in a minute. Um, but yeah, I'm the vice president. I help out Ricardo. I um, also organize social events. We actually have a picnic tomorrow, so that's pretty fun. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Totally just over the fact that I'm the president. Yeah. Um, I figured it was on the on the presentation. She president. Yes. Yeah. So um, <laughs> talking a little bit about the ETSU SAA chapter. Um, so SAA is the National Student Division of the American Academy of Audiology. Um, this is our current exec board. Unfortunately, our treasurer and secretary couldn't be here with us today, but um, talking a little bit about what SAA does. So we do some community engagement and outreach, networking, research, and advocacy, kind of just raising awareness for the field of audiology by doing various events in the community, um, presentations kind of within the department as well, kind of talking about timely subjects. Um, we also do some things on the national SAA level. So some of the exec officers will participate in some meetings talking about the growing diversity of the field, um, as well as just kind of some of the timely topics, such as over-the-counter hearing aids, what that means for the field of audiology moving forward. Um, so those are just a few of the things that we're doing at the moment. Um, and on the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about some of the things that we've done in the last year that have been really kind of a big focus for us. So um, one of the main things that I really wanted to focus on, especially since in the last year or two, we haven't been able to do as much community outreach, just kind of due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that focus on community outreach has been, you know, previously we did the remote area medical um, kind of event in which we, along with many other health professions, um, went to this event to kind of, you know, perform hearing evaluations and give out hearing aids to those who qualify, particularly those who um, may be uninsured or have difficult access to health care. Um, and that's been a pretty kind of routine tradition for the program in the last, what, five to ten or so years. Um, we unfortunately weren't able to do that this year. 14 so, years. Yeah. 14 years. Um, so way beyond my time, too. <laughs> uh, so one of the focuses this year for me was being able to kind of give back out to the community a little bit more than we had previously, just kind of due to the pandemic, especially since we weren't doing RAM this year. So that's kind of been, you know, doing senior center presentations and hearing screenings. So in the last maybe six or months, six months or so, um, we've done hearing screenings at the Johnson City Senior Center, the Elizabeth Baptist Senior Center, the Jonesboro Senior Center, as well as the Bethel House um, Residential Community as well. And I guess our kind of main event community engagement event coming up is the Deerfield Retirement Community in Nashville. So we do some things in the local area, but as well as kind of traveling a little bit, maybe an hour or so, and doing some bigger kind of events as well. Um, what is the, you know, the more fun stuff, I guess, um, we do some fundraising too. So we do a VA bake sale. Um, we also have been working on a lot of merchandise. We came out with these Otaconia stickers, which is kind of a play on the Patagonia logo. Oh, it's oh, on the back, back of back phone. Phone. <laughs> <laughs> So if you like the stib and that's something you're interested in, um, we definitely do a lot of that here, both clinically and also there's a lot of people that are interested in that as well. Um, also social and volunteer events. So, um, here in this picture is a social gathering that we planned at Dr. Fagelson's house. Um, he's always really kind and really generous to help us do um, little social events and little social bonding between the faculty and the students. Um, we recently did the VA trunk retreat, which was really fun working with the VA faculty and planning that. Um, we also did the VA Feds Feed Families, so kind of, you know, gathering donations um, to kind of, you know, uh, kind of address food insecurity, especially among our veteran populations. I believe this past year we raised 156 pounds of, of canned food. Um, so that was a big accomplishment. Um, I'm trying to think about a couple other things that we did. So yeah, during COVID good. time, one of the things that these guys did was plant uh, pink flamingos. <laughs> flamingo the yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. you wake up in the morning and pink flamingos outside <laughs> the yard. 
uh, I think they, they did well with that because yeah. they held the hostage of you until you pay up and for them to remove them. And then you, you can you can show your love to others by sponsoring Flamingo somebody else. So that was fun. And another thing I wanted to you know, mention is we do have a faculty mentor who is Dr. Height. Um, one of the many, many, many things she does for the program is also work um, with us mm -hmm. to kind of you know oversee SEA, how it's going and how it's moving forward in the future. Um, so we also really love working closely with Dr. Hyde to kind of give us some guidance about where we're moving. Um, and we also have been really active on social media. So if you kind of want to see what we're up to, what the students are doing, um, know a little bit more about us, you can follow us there. Um, and then the, the past, and I think they were, they'll do a Special Olympics also, so mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. better than the Special Olympics. When's that coming up? Coming up. What, do you remember I believe it's happened? late November. Mm -hmm. Okay. Later, late November. Is that one in? So we will, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, we also recently had two students go to the Knoxville, um, what is it, the Tennessee Audiology and Speech Language Pathology Convention. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So we, you know, the, that's a pretty expensive event to go to in terms of paying a ticket, but we were able to get our, our students to go as volunteers, so that was kind of waived, and they were able to get all that good information and knowledge as well. And if you're around tomorrow, you're going to meet at Watauga Point yeah. uh, on the lake. Uh, it's very pretty. Uh, they know the ball foliage and for burgers and hot dogs. So plenty of room for collaboration with both the ETSU faculty and the VA faculty. Um, we've had a great time. Me and Hallie have kind of been overseeing SAA and working with the other two exec officers and kind of, you know, giving back out to the community and collaborating with the faculty. All right. Now yeah, this year they've done great by reaching out to the community and doing this screenings and making it in fact that's not something the issue is going to be involved uh, is the community partnerships uh, more heavily and we already have we have been doing that for a while uh, here's our contact information and uh, we have some time for questions and, and answers. I know we uh, uh, preface that we did run late <laughs> uh, but do you all have any questions about stuff and then I want to build some opportunity for you guys to talk to our students they're going to introduce themselves and faculty will step out uh, and then uh, <laughs> dr bramlett is also waiting for you guys with a few other students if you'd like a tour of the nave facility do you all have the address to that place yeah so i i would like to to let you know what's in those uh, packets so uh we print it i uh, print it the program of studies so it's the uh that's another bad news you don't have any choices. We don't have any electives. Everybody takes the same program of study. And this is for the purpose. That's what Dr. Hyde mentioned. We would like our students to be ready to work in any field or subfield of audiology that you would like to do. Pediatric, veterans, uh, vestibular, tinnitus, whatever you would like to do, we provide in terms of didactic courses and clinics. So this is the sequence of, of courses. Uh, I also, again, my, my daughter's laughing at me, Dad, everybody has GPS. You don't need a printed map. I said, yes, but I still like it. So, so there's a map, how to get to the maze. There's an address, so you can, it's relatively easy. You got out of ETS, you go to University Parkway and then follow up to the uh, Elizabeth. And I also, in the packet, there, there is also another from, from the grad school. You see, the, the grad school actually gave you some glasses and some pens and some other stuff. I put my, my, my card there. There is also card of the, another Ricardo, Ricardo Papia, who is in the grad school, uh, responsible for recruiting. I, I communicate with them relatively uh, frequently right now. Uh, and uh, we, uh, as I know, we direction came. Okay. Uh, the lamb hole, that's when our department was located for many years, is finishing the extension and remodeling. We will be, will be hopefully back in the spring for uh, going back to our offices and we'll also have some lab space. But, but right now, we on the Oakley Hall are uh, on the second floor, grad, grad schools on the first floor. So if I have any questions, I just... Well, you probably saw the construction coming in for the football side, yeah. We're yeah. excited that we're going to be back over there 
um, screen. Be a screen. Yeah. And we probably will start using that, you know, those new state of the art uh, classrooms for teaching uh, this, this summer. So they were getting new boots also here. Just two days back, they were, they were like training them up. So there was a heavy panel. So training up to the window to inside. Yeah, you're all geeky excited about that. <laughs> Uh, another thing is because that's typically questions. So we're looking for class uh, 10 to 12 students. That's our typical class size. Uh, of course, our dean would like to see as many as possible. We're trying to tell, well, 12 is probably uh, the, the largest class. And we had a class, those that those students that graduated uh, in 2021, there was a class of 12 students. Uh, currently, third, uh, fourth year is a class of 12, so uh, that's what we be looking. And again, the idea is that, I mean, I don't mind having in my NP course, you know, 40 students. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that will be, I mean, look at us and say, okay, are you really sure? Man? You think 40 students, we take a risk of taking your class? Nah. But, uh, but, I mean, the clinical component is the issue. We really would like, and again, as Dr. Hyde emphasized, and we can't emphasize it enough, students are in the clinic week, the first week in the program. So we can't, we don't, we're not in a you know, big metropolitan area. So we, we have some you know, limitations of very effective clinical training. So that's what limits our class size, okay? Any question from the audience? Any question from those on Zoom, Ricardo? Let's see. So the plan is for those who are, again, a few students going to stay back, but do we have a hand count of who's going to make the travel to the NAVE Center? Pretty much everybody. Okay, well, that's, sure. That's I mean, that's, that's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, this, uh, yeah they, they should be here giving you a tour of that. And there's still a few students there to talk to. Uh, but you can spend a few minutes with our students that are here. Um, and we will then, then leave. Uh, yeah, we are planning on uh, preparing a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation because there are a lot, a lot of information. We have to kind of speed a little bit. Uh, but again, feel free if you have any questions during the, the during the application process, send me an email. I try my best to respond as quickly as possible. And uh, if you, I'm sure uh, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of our, our current students. If you have any question to the current students, some advice, you know, uh, or about, you know, the experience in the program, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to communicate with you. So if you have any question, please, please do not hesitate. If you, if you would like to have a, a Zoom session uh, with your questions, show sure, absolutely we'll be more than happy to help you because we we understand how important that decision is and you might have tons of questions and we're ready to help you and uh, so please stay in touch it's nice meeting you all <laughs>